Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. This is our third in our series of healthy discussions. My name is Sue Huppert. I'm Vice President for Institutional Advancement here at Des Moines University. President Angela Franklin could not be here. She is traveling across the country with her youngest son, Jordan, taking him to college. And for those of us that have been in that position, you know she would... Uh, she needs to be where she is, let's just say. So, um, but she did want us to extend our thanks to you, Congressman. We also have in the audience Dr. Larry Baker, who is our chair-elect for the Des Moines University Board of Trustees, and we appreciate him being here as well. Des Moines University has a long history in educating healthcare professionals. You'll see on the map up here, we have over 2,200 of our alumni throughout the state of Iowa that are uh, contained within our three colleges and our nine degree programs. Our mission here is to improve lives in the global community by educating highly diverse groups of competent and compassionate health professionals. I will also add for our speaker today that we have a high number of students who are committed to the military. Do we have any of our military students in the audience today? Would you please stand? I know that this commitment is extremely important to our guest speaker today, and he will probably touch on that as he does in many of his uh, speeches about the importance of, of our military. Um, but we have over 60 of our students in the Doctor of Osteopathic Program and the DPM, Doctor of Podiatric Medicine and Surgery Pro Program. All of these students making a commitment after graduation to serve our country, so thank you. I'm here today to introduce, though, the person who will introduce our speaker, and that is Dr. Andy McGuire. She is the co-chair for the Partnership for Better Health, the group that's putting on um, this series. Dr. McGuire is presently the president and chief operating officer of Meridian Health Plan in Iowa. Her education includes her medical doctorate and master of business administration. She has focused her academic career on nuclear medicine with an emphasis of breast cancer research at Washington University. Dr. McGuire serves on numerous boards, um, and her focus is generally regarding health, women, and children. Uh, she presently is the chair of the University of Iowa School of Public Health Board of Advisors, and in addition to being the co-chair for the Partnership for Better Health, she is a board member on the Prairie Meadows Board of Directors, and they're very good friends to Des Moines University, so thank you, as well as the Civic Center of Greater Des Moines. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Andy McGuire. Thank you so much for that introduction, Sue. Um, good afternoon, and welcome to our third of several healthy discussions hosted by Des Moines University and the Partnership for Better Health. This is a series of bipartisan, I want to emphasize that, forums that will give Iowa congressional delegation members their own platform for discussing critical health, wellness, and workforce issues. Uh, they're really important to us Iowans. It also provides us an opportunity to give input on what Congress does regarding health care reform in the next few years. I want to specifically thank Bourne University for helping us, and President Franklin, I do know, um, Sue, what it's like to take your children off to college. I have a couple more left, but I've taken five, and it's a very big experience. Um, and I want to thank Sue Hubbard for being here, and I want to thank them for um, graciously offering us to use this place with Partnerships for Better Health. Um, as the co-chair for Partnerships for Better Health, I would like to take this opportunity to share with you what it is we do. The Partnership for Better Health is a network of 60, and there's a rumor that's actually 61 now, which is wonderful. It's always, every time I do a speech about Partnerships for Better Health, it's gone up by some more. So, and I think at the beginning, we thought we'd have 15 or 20. So it's really a group that's growing, and that tells you because we actually do a very good job of bringing up all those issues for everyone, and, and together we are stronger. I think someone else said that. Um, so anyhow, I'd like to take an opportunity to tell you what we do. So we're very involved with um, organizations of those 60 providers, advocates, and consumers whose goal it is is to address lowering the cost of health care. And how do you do that? We think you do that through prevention, intervention, and innovation. It's the intent of the partnership to educate those who seek and hold political office in our country on these issues. Specifically, 
We want to ensure that elected officials understand the importance of that, of prevention, intervention, and innovation, and how if we're successful with that, we can actually reduce the cost of health care and improve the quality. The Partnership for Better Health does not support or oppose individual candidates or political parties in any way or advocate for specific legislation. We're basically not lobbyists. What we are is advocates. We're advocates for the people with chronic disease and for prevention, innovation, and intervention. Now, I have the honor to introduce a person who I just, um, he's my congressman, what can I say? Uh, Iowa Congressman Leonard Boswell. I want to tell you a little bit about him. He's been in the U.S. House of Representatives in, since 1996. He's a member of the Agricultural Committee. Committee. Boswell serves as the ranking member of the Subcommittee on General Farm Commodities and Risk Management, very important right now with our drought. He also serves on the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, infrastructure, if I could talk, and two of its subcommittees, the Subcommittee on Aviation, which is very dear to his heart, I know, and the Subcommittee on Highways and Transit. Boswell's leg legislative career began in 1985 in the Iowa State Senate. I know many of you, um, the older people in the audience, know him from that. Uh, he was in the Senate from 1990, in 1992 and 1994, and he was elected the Senate President. He also served as the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee. Prior to his legislative career, Congressman Boswell spent 20 years in the Army, as we were talking about earlier, eventually retiring at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He's a Vietnam veteran. He served two one-year tour of duties as an assault helicopter pilot. During his military career, he earned two distinguished flying crosses, and we always talk because my father was a, um, an ace in World War II, and he had a distinguished flying cross, and it's it's not any award you would get lightly, and you should talk to him about it because it really says a lot about the kind of man he is. He also got the Soldier's Medal, two Bronze Stars, and an Air Medal with V device, and numerous other awards and decorations. Congressman Boswell still maintains an interest in agriculture through his operation of the family farm, and he has three children and four grandchildren with his wife, Dodie. So with no further ado, let's talk to Congressman Boswell. Well, thank you, Dr. McGuire. I, uh, <clears throat> I say this often, and I, I think I probably will continue to do so. Gee, I wish my mother had been here and heard that. <laughs> and if she had been, she'd have probably said, why don't you just sit down? Everything's for your head. <laughs> I, uh, I guess I have about 20 minutes or whatever, and then we'll take Q&A and so on. So look at that chart just sitting there. Uh, I want to report to you, your alumni char uh, situation, that in my current district, we have uh, alumni in every county. In my new district, which I'm going to, we have an absence down there in the corner called Fremont. Let's do something about that. Okay? So we'll work on that. And then I have the other zero is happens to be in what we refer to as my home county. And I know that we've had uh, people there in the years past, uh, but... Uh, I haven't kept up with what that's all about, but uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I like being here. I've been here many other times, and uh, as I was sharing with uh, one of my student escorts, uh, uh, this very, very special place. It really is. And when I came into the legislature, and I came because I got drafted. Uh, you talked about my military a little bit. Uh, yes, I did advance to that situation, but I was uh, drafted. I was a private when I started and uh, was drafted right here in Des Moines. They used to have the induction center down at, some of you might recall, the old KRNT theater, but it was the induction center. I got drafted on my birthday. So I never forgot my day of entry, of course, and uh, there wasn't much uh, draft going on in those days uh, because there was not a war going on. That was uh, in that period of time. And uh, anyway, uh, chose to accept that. I could have been deferred. I, we were married and pregnant and so on, but decided, no, I want to serve my country. And I never regretted it because some tough things happened, but, you know, this is a wonderful, wonderful country we get to live our lives in. And uh, there's certainly other nice, wonderful places, but I'm proud that I get to live my life here. And so I was glad to do that. So I was drafted, and then <clears throat> times were hard, and the pay was not good, and then the, because of education, key word, education, 
first of my family to go to Graceland, which is a little university down in southern Iowa. Uh, did fairly well on some testing, and so I was asked if I'd be interested in going to officer's candidate school. And I did, and then that starts a whole process of uh, if I end up staying for 20 years. Actually ended up as the instructor at the Command and General Staff College down in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. It's sort of like a graduate school for Army guys, so Command and General Staff, Fort Leavenworth, it's a good thing. Well, I, I want to make a few remarks as, as I'm kind of spinning around here a little bit, then I'll go to my notes so I'll cover the stuff that uh, my staff said I had to do and then so on. But, uh, you know, all of us need health care. I mean, it's pretty basic. And I don't have to think back too many years ago when Leonard Boswell was overweight uh, in sedentary-type activities, different than farming and other things I'd done and so on. And But uh, I don't want anybody to have to lose weight like I did because I got sick. And uh, thanks to wonderful health care, and I don't know, does anybody know the name of Kendall Reed, Dr. Kendall Reed? <laughs> well, when I had my problem that I was not going to go into any details on and so on, but uh, uh, Dr. Greg Peterson, graduated from here, uh, is my physician, and led me to Dr. Reed and so on. I love this place. I'm alive. I'm blessed that I had wonderful health care, and a lot of that route goes to here. And as we learn about things, and I, I appreciate Governor Branstad's uh, Healthy State Initiative, I think it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. We can do better if we learn, and that's what, of course, it's all about here, and many other possibilities. I'll mention just briefly uh, have a much healthier nation and a much healthier population, and this population is growing by leaps and bounds. As you know, it's well on its way towards 9 billion, and that's forecast. It'll just get there quicker than what people say, in my opinion. And uh, so we need to do things better. So I'm, I'm glad for the uh, Healthy State uh, initiative that the governor is pushing. Uh, some of that goes back to in our current district up at Grundy Center at the school. They've got a, uh, a PT for Life program there that is just great. If you don't know about it, you'd be in, you ought to check into it. It's really good. The whole community uh, participates in it, and uh, it's amazing. I won't take time to go into a lot of details about it, but it's a very, very good thing, and I'm sure that there's a lot of those features in the uh, Healthy State Initiative. And I know we, you know, we'll do what I do. We do a lot of parades, and uh, <clears throat> we were in a parade up there. Well, first off, we were visiting the school, and you remember Sally used to be our chief staff. We walked away, and we were having a conversation. We're leaving, and she said, "What did you something about what did you notice?" And the point she wanted to make: there wasn't any overweight children. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's right. Then another time, a couple of years later, we were in a parade up there, 4th of July or whatever it was, and, of course, we throw candy. If you don't, well, they don't like you, so you throw candy. I don't like throwing candy because I like to look at people like, you know, and that's why I get to pick up trucks so I can make eye contact, if you've noticed, and uh, greet them when, as I recognize people and so on, so I have somebody else throwing the candy. But we finished that parade that day. We were driving. We were back, and the question came up again. What did you notice? Well, I knew it was a trick question, so I I just want to just tell me what did we what did we notice? So there wasn't any overweight children along the parade route. There were lots and lots of children. So anyway, just leave that thought with you. And uh, so I think we we rate pretty high. You doctors can tell me with the uh, obesity and diabetes and things that we really could do something about, and we must do that. And I hope that we will. I first went to Congress and I became aware of the Medicare reimbursement rate. Any of you know about that? Yeah, we were 50th in the nation. I said, how can this be? And I looked that chart over and tried to understand it and talking with some of the folks here and others around, uh, I thought, this, is, <clears throat> this doesn't make sense. 
there were reimbursement rates. Uh, the figures would be off now, but it was like 3,500 on the average compared to the, the uh, or, or at the bottom where we were. The average around uh, 5,500, and then the top was a, almost double. Now all the big states were in the above average, but up at the top was uh, was Louisiana. I have nothing against Louisiana, nothing at all. But I had been stationed down there, lived down there, and done some things about the good people, lots of good people, but I never, ever had the idea that their health care was a lot better than ours. And so I got interested in that, and so <clears throat> uh, with uh, some of you and uh, Todd Linden over at Grinnell and others, we got involved in it, and uh, so we started challenging it and uh, concluded only that uh, I guess when they started, they must have done some kind of a survey, and I finally come to the conclusion, well, I with uh, doctors and, uh, and, and hospitals and so on must have been just honest about it and said, well, this is what we're doing, and they didn't pad it. I, I don't know that. Others padded, but something caused that to be askew, and uh, we couldn't get a handle on it. So we've got to have some reform. We've got to do something. We must do something for fairness and also for our people and so on. I... Uh, presented this to uh, <clears throat> the Clinton administration. I presented it to the Bush administration. I personally laid it right in their hands and suggestions on working with uh, some of our others, or Senator Harkin to be exactly on how we might approach to make some adjustments to that and just could get no traction. So when uh, we had the gentleman named Barack Obama elected, I hoped that he would address the situation, and uh, as has. And I'll never forget, sitting in the White House in February after his inauguration, about 40 or so of us were there to talk about uh, different things, and uh, one of the things that came up was to, to deal with uh, affordable health care. And he said, and I, this is a direct quote, and I think it's right on, I'm not going to kick the can down the road. It's tough. As I recall, we've been hearing about this since Teddy Roosevelt. And he said, I'm not going to kick the can down the road. And hasn't. And so uh, that leads me into some of the things I'd like to share with you. But you know, <clears throat> back to my notes if I could, and I'll give, we'll go to your Q&A and, and go where you want to go. But you know a lot about me, what Dr. McGuire said and so on. You know, that I come from southern Iowa, Born in tenant farmhouse, you didn't tell that part, but I've gotten to enjoy the American dream. It's important to me for you, and I realize that we have uh, possibilities of a shortage, and those will give health care. And you guys here coming here to this great university, and I believe that sincerely, will do that. I applaud you for it. It costs a lot of money, and I run into constantly the situation where they got this humongous debt. And I think it's part of our problem as a nation. If we want to have health care providers out there, people that will take the time and take the training and the preparation that's needed, then the rest of us have some responsibility too. And so I am very keen on uh, and working on that, and I have, and I will continue to do so. And some of the things, well, I'm, gonna, I'm digressing. We'll go through my notes here right quick, and then I'll probably go fairly fast, and then we'll get to the other. But, you know, I, uh, I believe, and I think I'm emphasizing that, that we deserve a reliable access to high-quality, affordable care. And, of course, I voted for that legislation that works towards accomplishing that. I don't believe for a minute that we won't need to tweak it and make some adjustments. But I think it's something that was long, long overdue. I think we're up to task as a country. We're fortunate enough to live in a country where we... Uh, you know, if we have and we can, I understand from some of my people in the healthcare business that we're kind of falling behind when some things are going on in Europe and other places. We don't have to do that. We have to invest in it. We have to do the research. We've got to do the education. And that's something that we know and must do. And I want to be always supporting that. I understand not everyone supports the health care law. Uh, there's Democrats here, I'm sure. There's Republicans here, I'm sure. I'm sure there's independents here. And that's good. This is America. And I respect those who disagree with the law, but contrary to some of the scares and myths that are out there, it is working, in my opinion. 
and I'm happy to defend that. I will be the first to tell you that tweaks will have to be made. We've mentioned that, I'm sure. We've had to tweak Social Security and Medicare and affordable health care will be no different. We have to tweak the uh, infrastructure bill, transportation, a farm bill comes up every five years. We have to work on that, so this is not something that's foreign to us. But we must ensure hardworking middle-class families will get the security they also deserve and protect Americans from being denied coverage of unfair rates and the law was created and how do we deal with this and how do we make it available. A major thing that I know about Des Moines University and our state's providers are especially interested in what the health care law is doing on the personal side. Since it was enacted in March of 2010, over 4 million private sector jobs, many being in the health care industry, have been created. That surprised a few people, but not those of you that are associated with Iowa Health and many things that goes on here in this state. You know that and, and, and promulgate that. I appreciate it. Specifically, Department of Labor figures show that over 630,000 jobs have been uh, created in the health care industry. Now, we'll, we can go back to the Secretary and let them define and defend that, but that's what they're claiming. Affordable health care makes key investments in health care jobs including critical investments to increase the number of health care providers and strengthen the primary care workforce. Specifically, it makes investments to help alleviate the current shortage of primary health care providers, including physicians and physician assistants. I think a lot of people are experiencing a lot of, mis a lot of misinformation. I hear it every day from those who are determined to rehash the political battles instead of focusing on what people are most concerned when getting people back to work and available health care to all of us. Here's what the law means for the middle class. Just a few points. And there's many more. <clears throat> Insurance companies no longer have unchecked power to cancel your policy, deny you coverage, or charge women more than men. I didn't realize that was going on. And I didn't like it. Soon, no American will ever again be denied care or charged more due to a pre-existing condition like cancer or asthma. Preventive care will still be covered free of charge by insurance companies, including mammograms for women and wellness visits for seniors. We know those wellness visits are very important. We know that if we do the preventive things, it not only gives us a better life and uh, enjoyable of life, Extended life, but it saves a lot of money, and that's important. But uh, to take care of people is what's most important. And some of the stories got started over physicians uh, counseling with uh, their seniors on what they ought to be doing. Uh, counseling. What, uh, you know, what can you do better to, to live better, be healthier? And, of course, the, the, you know, the, uh, the patient can decide to do it or not to do it. But a story got started, you're going to pull the plug on Grandma. I couldn't believe it. I was sitting next to Bob Etheridge from North Carolina today, but one of the members made that statement. I said, that's a pretty ridiculous statement. Nobody will pay attention to that. Huh. Thirty days later, some days later, we were sitting at the same time and the same place. You know what? They've said it often enough. People are starting to believe it. That's simply not true. Many seniors will continue to save $600 a year on their prescription drugs. You know some of you about the donut hole, and that uh, is going to disappear, something that I certainly did not support when it passed, kind of a pharmaceutical giveaway, if you will. Efforts to strengthen and protect Medicare by cracking down on waste, fraud, and abuse will remain in place. Nobody objects to that, whatever it is. Put daylight on it. If it needs some things done to it, have the courage to do it. If it's doing okay, leave it alone. And that's what the principle there is. And then the, the millions of young adults who are able to stay on their family plan until they're 26. You know, this recession caused quite a shock. A lot of you, uh, I know a couple of you right here in the audience, have spent a lot of money assisting and helping and pushing the youngsters to get, a, you know, a college degree and so on, job not available, but oh, they're off insurance now. Well, this means that they can be with her on the family plan. Now, on the flip side uh, of building this progress that's been made, <clears throat> those that are advocating to repeal the Affordable Care Act 
will take away essential health care benefits and patient protections for millions of Americans, including 129 million Americans with pre-existing conditions would lose security of health care, including 17 million children starting in 2014. 6.6 .6 million young adults, including 3.1 million who were previously uninsured, would no longer be guaranteed that they could stay on their parents' health care plans until age 26, which we just mentioned. 67,000 Americans with pre-existing conditions would become uninsured if the insurance marketplace uh, chose to do so and unlock them out. 15 million Americans could be dropped by their insurance companies who would be allowed to retroactively cancel coverage for sick patients based on unintentional mistake in their paperwork. I don't think anybody wants to see that happen. So I, I, I very much remain committed to see this through. Yes, I think it'll need some tweaking. That's not unusual, as we've already mentioned, to make sure that people are not denied coverage, but treated fairly, and the law continues to ben benefit both the patient and the provider in the best possible way we can. I'll just touch on a couple other things, and I think I'll stop and see what's on your mind, because I want to know what's on your mind. I need to know. This is an opportunity to find that out. But protecting and strengthening Social Security and Medicare have always been a, a top priority for me. I remember four or five years ago when a big effort was made to take Social Security to uh, Wall Street. If it had happened and what would have happened to us this recession is hard to imagine. It would have been a bad thing. And I was very much opposed to that. We need to preserve programs for future generations. I will stand up against the risky privatization schemes that are being proposed, yes, I'll say it, by the, the Romney-Ryan budget. With the state's elderly population growing, and Iowa is one of those states, as you know, it is increasingly important that Social Security and Medicare continue to provide Iowans with the security and peace of mind that I believe we deserve, they deserve. The National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare has, I'll brag a little bit, but they've given me a 100% score on the issue. And uh, I, pre I didn't know that until I saw these notes, so I appreciate that very much. I will support changes to Medicare that make seniors healthier and improve the quality of care that they receive, and will continue to work to continue successful incentive programs for rural health care providers. And I think I was sharing with some of you when I came to the Iowa Senate years ago and realized we had a shortage of uh, physicians out in the country that I was part of a program and I got into the appropriation side to create some uh, assistance uh, if a commitment would be made to go to the country and to provide health care that uh, they could be helped with their tuition. Very successful. One thing I learned over the years that they got out there to these little communities and so on. Gee, this is pretty good. I think we'll just stay out here. And so that's been a, a good thing. And then you look at that chart over there and you see some of that result. And uh, it's a good thing. So I, again, am very, very proud of uh, our home state. We, we're proud of a lot of things. I'm proud of Des Moines University. I'm proud of homegrown Hy-Vee. Started right down there in southern Iowa at Beaconsfield. I'm proud of John Deere. So there's a lot of things for us to be proud of. I just start to leave it there. Anyway, it's good to be with you today, and I don't know who's going to monitor the questions, but somebody is. Is it you, Dr. McGuire? All right. Well, you know, I'll just uh, step aside, and if I don't know the answers, I'll just refer to you. Okay. Well, I don't know if that'll work, but uh, do we have some questions from the audience? Shan? I don't know. Do we have a? Yeah, okay. I have a little hearing impairment, so I've got to make sure I understand it. All okay. right. Yes, I start out first every day. Thank you, Congressman, for being here today, and thank you for your support of health care. I want to ask you specifically about Medicare, and I appreciate you indicated your support for that as well. You know, there are some new benefits there in being able to get the, the uh, pre fully paid preventive screenings and um, the closing of the donut hole. Um, the Romney-Ryan budget would eliminate those uh, benefits. And they're saying that, you know, we can't afford um, Medicare as it is today. So how do you see us going forward with keeping those benefits and, and continuing to afford them? Well, I think we've talked about that. Thank you for that, to, that comment, that point. You know, 
I think affordable health care is working. I think we had a great need for it, and I was just more than pleased when I found out that this administration was going to take it, take it on. And I was supportive of it then. I am now. I understand that we may have to do, as we get feedback from this university, from the hospitals, we get, we're getting some all the time, and we're going to make some tweaks and adjustments. But we've done that to Social Security. We've done it to many, many things. But it's not something new for us to do. So I, I would think it would be a, a wrong, wrong-headed to go back on it. And uh, I don't anticipate that really happening. I think the American people are starting to realize that a lot of good things have come out of the Affordable Health Care Act. Who wants to give up this pre-existing condition protection? Who wants to give up the program for the up to 26 years old if the, once they graduate? You know, who wants to give up the preventive uh, assistance uh, for seniors or the mammogram checks? Who, how many women want to be left uh, in a different schedule than uh, men? You know, what's what they're talking about? And now you hear other people saying, you know, uh, you may have heard it even off this platform. Well, we're going to take care of some of those good things. Well, what is it? And we've got a good plan. Let's just make it work and tweak it if we need to. But it is working. And I have every confidence we can make it work. This United States of America, we can make this happen. I'm Dick Deming, a medical director of Mercy Cancer Center. And also, uh, nine years, I was a Navy doctor. So, Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks for your comments. You know, you articulated some of the very positive things of the Affordable Care Act, and as a cancer doctor, there's nothing more important than prevention and early detection and elimination of pre-existing illnesses and elimination of caps on, on health care and so many positive things from the Affordable Care Act. I want to ask you about another aspect of the Affordable Care Can Act. Can I comment on that just since, since you said you Sure. Just, and I'm right back to you. Well, yeah, I had the experience, and some, the Army guy or the military person back to mind, I was an Army guy, and I had a, an NATO assignment where I was executive assistant to a Navy admiral in NATO over in Portugal. We protect the shipping lanes going in and out of uh, Mediterranean with the Russian submarines in those days. And uh, <clears throat> you mentioned preventive detection or the detect, early detection. Admiral Flucky, F-L-U-C-K-E-Y, is, uh, is a name that uh, you might know, Congressional Medal of Honor, uh, uh, four uh, Navy Crosses, uh, you know, it's quite a book. I, I was his executive assistant. What an experience. If it's in NATO, we wouldn't go to sea, and so on. And uh, his wife was a cancer patient. And she was getting her checkups every six months at that time or so, because she it was in her family, and they're being very careful, and they got orders to move, and she skipped. What, she didn't do one of her checkups. And uh, the time came when he was ready to go on for another star and so on, and uh, she had come down with uh, cancer. And they skipped over that checkup. And she got all the young wives, my wife and then all the rest of them, and they sat around her, and she said, don't you ever stop, get your mammogram checks, and do all the things you can do to be sure that if there is that problem, it's detected early. Because as you know, you can tell me, if it's detected early, generally you can take care of it. It's after a certain point, it's pretty tough. Yeah, and that's exactly right. You know, we can have the best health care in the world, but if you don't have access to prevention and early detection, all you're left with is a safety net that catches you when it's too late to uh, cure someone of cancer. And so my question is specifically about the Affordable Care Act and, and its uh, um, uh, provision to expand access for those least able to afford it, and that's those up to 138 percent of of the poverty level. And the Affordable Care Act allows states to expand the Medicaid roles so that those that are in the, uh, the, that are least able to go out and afford it on their own, and probably the least sophisticated to get through all of the different uh, other channels, can go on to Medicaid and have basic health care with prevention, early detection, and, and care. 
obviously the states have the ability to decide based on the supreme court ruling of whether they're going to allow that expansion or not governor branstad has weighed in on that and i just will ask for your comments on what you think the state should do and um, kind of uh, anticipating what your answer might be, how can we in Iowa affect the process so that we can do what we can to help make sure that those least able to afford health care are allowed to, um, to take advantage of the Affordable Care Act? Well, as you said very well, the Supreme Court acted on it and, uh, you know, a lot of it was, you know, what we wanted to really hear except the, that little piece there. And so states have that option, and uh, I think it's going to take all of us in the different states that would have a leader that would choose not to to continue the education process. You know, we're going to have to speak up and let them know. And one of the things that uh, didn't happen in the Affordable Care Act, uh, you know, was the, the, the public option. And uh, if that would have happened, I think that it would have had a lot of impact on availability and, uh, and the way it would have worked, uh, I think, better. But uh, at some point, uh, that may still happen. You never know. That might, who knows? That might be a tweak that will come down the road as, uh, as we go forward and go, go that direction. But I, I, would, uh, I would hope that uh, at some point that our governor, and, <clears throat> and I said very respectfully, he used to be president of this university. And uh, he was governor when I was in the state senate. Uh, he was our governor at that time. And I would just hope that as he has time to think about this and study it and get information in, as we all do, that, uh, that he'll uh, make a change of heart. And I think that, that could happen. Hi, Congressman. Um, you made a couple of comments about the Healthy State Initiative um, and where that can uh, help Iowa to progress to. And in regards of GMA, GME funding, and we've been reassured by a couple of your colleagues that have been here um, in the past week or two that sequestration hopefully will be resolved. And so looking beyond that and that we need additional GME funding and maybe reallocated some to be, for there to be more residency spots in Iowa, so hopefully we can someday be on that board as well. Do you see that being a possibility, either more spots coming to Iowa or additional funding to graduate medical education? Well, I would hope so, and I will certainly continue to work on that as well. And uh, sequestration is something that, uh, you know, it was kind of held out there as a club to make people uh, do things, and so this will this will happen if you don't uh, put this super committee together if you're following it. And but it required all the different factions of the Congress, you know, the Agricultural Committee, the Commerce Committee, the Transportation, all to come together, House and Senate, and have this proposal. There was only one element that did, and that was agriculture. And that's pretty much what the Senate Ag Bill is. The Farm Bill from that came over in June from the Senate was pretty much that. But the rest of them did not. I didn't think they would. I didn't think that was the way to go. Well, you got to set priorities. Education has got to be a high priority, I think, but it's an investment with a known return. It, you know, it, it pays. It pays back. Research, same category. And so we got to do those things that you know is going to move you forward, and that's got to have a higher priority. So uh, we struggled with all this, and, uh, you know, we uh, thought there was a lot of fluff took place in this last session, you know, offering up stuff that they knew was not going to pass, but, you know, it, made, it was a feel-good uh, to pass all these budget solutions that uh, were going nowhere. And so on, but you know, they, we got to get down serious. So finally, some of us, uh, you know, the uh, the president uh, put a committee together called Simpson Bowles, Republicans, former Senator Simpson, Democrat, former Chief of Staff uh, Bowles, and a group together to really study the pros and cons. You know, efficiencies, reductions, revenue side, and all this. Try to find something. Uh, not perfect, but a lot of us thought, well, you know, this might not be a bad starting point, but it never got any traction. It could have come out of committee. And so here recently we had an opportunity through uh, amendment offers. And myself, I was one that uh, supported it. There was about 38 or 40 of us. Uh, Jim Cooper from Tennessee, who I have a great respect for. Uh, a guy named Lauderette from Ohio just finally says, 
fully, I've had enough of this. He's resigned, but a very, very talented guy, and uh, I think moderate, as I feel like I am. And uh, so we put it up for a vote. I thought there'd be quite a few votes. There wasn't. And uh, I'm surprised because it could be a template to go forward and, and build it together to stop the partisan bickering going on and try to come up with a solution for you and the children that I hope that you have someday. Thank you very much. Congressman, I have a quick question for you. Um, with the baby boomer generation and then now with the Affordable Care Act, there's going to be many more patients who are going to be seeking care. You mentioned that the Affordable Care Act is going to provide increases in primary care, which would be required to treat all these patients. Can you describe the specifics of how primary care will be supported, either in increases of physicians or how else that will increase? Um, with the, the current load of patients, I know many primary care are getting burned out. And now on top of this, we're going to add even more patients. So can you describe how the Affordable Care Act well, alleviates that? Well, there's several pieces that go into that. One of it's uh, efficiencies of the current force out there, uh, efficiencies of how to do things better. And as we think about electronic records and different things that Dr. McGuire could know more about some of you than I knew, but a lot of you have talked to me about it, that you know would really save time. I don't know how many legislators or how many representatives of Congress you might want to ask them. Spend a day with a doctor. Go spend a day. I've done that. It was quite an eye-opener to, to do that. And as they are set up to deal with the flow of patients through the clinic and, the, you know, the examining rooms and so on, it worked pretty good until something, you know, they can make their record and everything stays good, until something comes along that uh, disrupted a, a car wreck. They bring in some uh, an emergency and everything gets uh, disrupted and errors are made and so on. And... Uh, that's why I've stood up and said, no, I don't think that the physicians are out to try to take advantage of anything and do anything wrong. Sometimes they get stuck in a position because what I just described is simply not fair and uh, all this requirement. So the Affordable Care uh, Health Care Act uh, streamlines a lot of that, and uh, I think that's good. Uh, going back to the Medicare discussion we had earlier, we're finding out that uh, – uh, the, uh, as we put the data together, and uh, Secretary Sebelius is working with us on that, I appreciate that, uh, that we're going to find other things we can do, you know, to, to, uh, to lessen the workload and, and do it better. And then I uh, personally, and I believe that you're going to see tweaking and also uh, what's there, that uh, places like Des Moines University are going to have more consideration uh, for filling that need. And... Uh, states as well. And so I, I think we can get there. We just got to have the will to do it. Hi, my name is Doug Chu. I'm a volunteer for the American Heart Association, also a heart disease survivor. My question as well involves the sequestration. The National Institute of Health uh, provides about $200 million to the state of Iowa, which translates into about 4,000 jobs into kind of research, important research into critical care. And uh, I'm wondering, with the upcoming sequestration, obviously, with faces uh, automatic cuts, and wondering what your thoughts were and how best we can protect that NIH funding overall and more specifically to Iowa and the Iowa jobs we have for that. Thank you. Well, good point. And I, the, the sequestration, uh, I, I, could, I didn't support that when that happened, but that's set that aside. It happened. And now we've got to deal with it. And, uh, boy, it's causing a lot of stress. Oh, my goodness. And uh, it's, I find it interesting that those that said we have to do this to put the pressure on, now the pressure's on, they don't want to do it. Well, I didn't want to do it to start with, in that matter. I wanted to set the priorities and put the vote up, which we've talked about, so don't, I won't rehash that. I'm willing to go to Simpson Bowles. I'm willing to do a number of things. What do I think will happen? I don't think sequestration will happen uh, in the f way it's laid out there at the moment, but... Uh, there's going to be a lot of grinding of teeth and so on between now and that decision being made. But, uh, you know, the, the big, uh, one of the big things, there's several, but one of the big things is national defense. And it would be pretty pretty big adjustment. 
but then again, you know, there ought to be some adjustment because, uh, you know, we have more in national defense than all the rest of the countries in the world. Now, that my, my old dad would say, well, that don't make a lot of horse sense, you know. And wait a minute, why are you doing that? And I often refer to the, those kind of things, you know, just like the city of Des Moines. We have to have a police force. It applies to many, many things. This university, uh, local school, uh, it just goes on and on. The state house. But just say the local police department, I don't know what, I'll just come up the figure. You need 100 for us to be safe. And so if you have less than 100, we're not safe. If you have more than 100, well, you don't really need them, so something else is not going to be taken care of, whether it's streets, parks, education, or whatever. It's a constant review on that balance. What do we really need? And we've got to put daylight on it and be willing to put, uh, that's one of my philosophies, I don't care what it is, if there's some question about it, examine it. Be willing to examine it, but have the discipline. If it's okay, leave it alone. And if it's not, do something about it. And I think that's what we've done about affordable health care. It wasn't working. We know about the discrepancies in Medicare reimbursement and just on up and down the line and unavailability and those millions of people who had no access. And how are we dealing with it? The emergency rooms. The cost to a premium uh, to people with health care uh, insurance, uh, 8 to 10 percent more than it would be, uh, you know, if uh, people had access or to, to heavy coverage and uh, pre-existing situation. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many calls we've had from parents, and they get all emotional about the fact that one of their children had a pre-existing condition and they couldn't get insurance. Could on the others, but not this one. And now they can. And how much it means to them as a family. It's, uh, it's hard to measure unless you've been through it. Uh, it's like a lot of other things. If you haven't been there, you don't know really what it's all about. Uh, so anyway... Uh, I think that you'll see some more talk about it. And the uh, lame duck may be very interesting. I don't think you're going to see a whole lot between Labor Day and November 6th. But uh, the, lame, the lame duck period could be a hoot. Hi, Congressman. My name is Braden Jackson. I'm a first-year medical student here. Um, my question is... Uh, kind of to go along with the gentleman in the white t-shirt is it has to do with the new, new um, student loans that uh, Congress passed to take that eliminated our subsidized student loans and doubled our interest rates that really affects my year because we're starting this year and I foresee this problem like making a shortage of family practitioners because our financial aid office here at the school on orientation day presented to us a slideshow saying that when we graduate in order to if you take out the full amount of loans which 90 percent of students do you have to make an annual income of over two hundred and fifty fifteen thousand dollars not to default on your loans that's what they predicted but the problem is the average family practitioner only makes around one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year and i just see this as creating a a short supply of doctors, and it's kind of puts us in a in a tough situation for those of us who want to be family practitioners. I warned you. I, I've got a hearing impairment. Uh, if you're going around the military, uh, around artillery pieces and jet engines, protect your ears. Uh, be sure and do that. And uh, so I'm going to ask Dr. McGuire to uh, repeat the question, and, uh, and we'll try to answer it. Well, and, and basically, I may not do as eloquent a job as you did, but about the new student loans that the interest rate has now, I believe, doubled um, because they've let a certain thing run out. So, um, and how are we going to have these primary care that you've talked about um, that we're going to have to have for the prevention and the intervention? How are we going to have those? And it's really going to really be a problem to have all those primary care when you can't afford to go to medical school to be that primary care physician, especially at the rates that um, the, the salaries that the primary care physicians will have. Is that? Well, I, I support Pell Grant. I support tuition aid. We, uh, we re-examined that uh, during, uh, before this last election uh, when we had a different majority and discovered that we could uh, get some efficiencies in there. 
and save uh, students a lot of money, cut the interest rate, uh, made some provisions uh, when you'd have to start payback after you got into uh, the workforce and so on. And there's no reason we can't keep that going. Now, how that will come out if we go through this debate, I don't know. But I am very much for continuing that availability. I think it's a, it's a, a gross mistake not to do it because we can and we ought to continue to do that. And uh, I would, uh, again, I think I already mentioned earlier, education is a top priority, and it needs to be because it's investment with a known return. It pays back, and we, we must keep doing that. We thank the Congressman. I want to thank you all for coming. And, you know, I, I guess as wrapping it up, what I'm hearing is, is very interesting because I heard a lot about prevention and how we have to have those doctors and we have to have the facilities and we have to be able to um, have our seniors be able to get that preventive care, have all our people be able to get that preventive care. Intervention, which is all about all of you in the workforce being able to give that kind of care. And if we don't have you there, you can't give that kind of care. So I, I think education being a priority for intervention as, as something we have to do for patients, I think is very important. And, and you're really thinking ahead, which I, I think in medical school I mostly kept my head down. So I'm glad you're thinking ahead and really being so socially involved. And then innovation. I mean, we can't do research without all of you. You know, many of you, believe it or not, will go into research. And we got to have that kind of innovation because that's the way. You know, you ask, how are we going to handle all these patients? Well, one way is to try to prevent with innovation, with research, try to actually not have some of these diseases anymore, that would help us with that kind of impact. So I really want to thank you all for coming and, and uh, joining us today, and I uh, hope you have a great rest of the day. Okay, it's not a question. Okay? that I felt that it was absolutely necessary to say a public thank you to you. I think that when you mention the name Alan Simpson, he calls us greedy geezers. So please don't mention his name too much. <laughs> uh, because your votes indicate that you don't believe we're greedy geezers. And again, thank you. And we look forward to more supportive votes in Congress. Thanks, Mitch.